Nice. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. And welcome to you, Rich. How are you doing? Yeah, really good. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the great intro. And that was all in five minutes. I did it every day. <laughs> That's me every day. Yeah, but I'm no, a, everything's good at the moment. Uh, obviously, um, pandemic-wise, we're all having to think um, differently. But it, it's great to be able to access technology to be able to still connect with with everybody. Uh, so hello, everybody. Get your questions in. Whatever you want to yeah, talk we want, about. We want a few questions tonight. We've um, we've we've got a lot to get to get through. Bit of chat. Like in the hair, Rich, are you struggling for a hairdresser? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely. I'm struggling for a hairdresser. It's uh, it's normally a lot shorter. Um, but yeah, anybody that's got any clippers, send them over. I definitely need a haircut. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rich, that was a really great little intro you have there on your on your Twitter feed. Big question: Tokyo 2020, 21, 22. Is it happening? Yeah, well, at the moment it is. We're all planning. We've got a playbook at the moment, which is like a, a, a book of actions going into Tokyo. Um, I would say 90% it's on. It depends on, on obviously how the pandemic um, plays out towards uh, the end of the year. The Olympics will be a little bit of a, a case study towards how the Paralympics will go. And obviously we've, we've got a couple of different differences between the Olympics and Paralympics regarding the actual participants themselves, which has to play a part in will the Paralympics take uh, take precedent in Tokyo. But hopefully it is. We're all prepared. We're, we're trying to work dynamically to uh, be the best we can be at the Paralympics in Tokyo. Is there, a, is there a greater support network or a different type of support network for Paralympic athletes who are travelling on the move? Well, it needs to be. There needs to be a, a network that's obviously athlete-focused. Uh, so some athletes what might need... Uh, different uh, support networks for them to be successful or just to, to be able to meet their needs. Uh, yeah. So lights, lights of me, obviously having a prosthetist out in uh, Tokyo supports uh, my needs, obviously with my, with my technology that I use. Uh, so obviously the Olympic guys have different things and uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. we just need to adapt our, our team to be successful. Yeah. Great. Um, Rich, we've got a, a varied audience here with us this evening. I think we've, we've got some of our regular prosthetic colleagues in the clinics who deliver mm -hmm. prosthetic services, at least in, in the UK, and they'll be more familiar with you and the type of work that we're involved with. We've also got some of our colleagues on the bracing side of our business. We've also got some users and their parents. Um, so we've got some children watching too. So we've got a few, a few people with different sort of insight into, into your background. We often talk about um, amputee rehabilitation. Rich, you you were born without legs, so that's not always the right description, is it? When we when we come to that kind of thing, but but your no. life as a child wearing prosthetics, how how was that for you? Well, you can you, for one, you can call me whatever you want. <laughs> if we you do, want to call me do. an amputee, that's fine. But um, yeah, obviously, it's fifty years uh, for Osser. Uh, as a company, yeah. I just wanted to obviously congratulate uh, the brand for the great work they continue to do. And I was lucky enough to um, and have been supported uh, by Osa for an amount of time that's really enriched my life. And that's not just uh, from the sporting uh, sense, because that's what you see, but it's every day and the prosthetics I used to walk around, as well as being able to access the professionals and the, the specialists yeah. within within the industry. And like you said, I was, I was born uh, an amputee in 1976. So I'm in my 40s and the environment in the 70s was completely different to it is yeah. now. Yeah. And um, OSA was not, was not on the radar at that point. And I was accessing obviously NHS prosthetics and services that also gave me a great platform moving yeah. forwards. I was yeah. lucky enough to have, have people around me that that understood that I was a different kind of animal at that stage where I was just kind of going at hundred miles an hour. I'm sure there's little ones that's on the, on the line on the call that parents may be able to associate with their yep. children, like bullet a gate, trying to do everything now. Rich, I remember the first time we met 2004, my colleague, Paul Jameson um, came to me one week and said, we're off to Nottingham. Uh, see the prosthetist, Terry Stanley. Um, yeah. He said, he's got this, uh, this young guy there, young guy, remember that? <laughs> uh, yeah, his, his name's Richard Whitehead. He's um, yeah, he wants to use some blades. He's uh, he's going to be running the New York Marathon. Uh, all right, that's yeah, great. So so when are we going? Yeah, Thursday. When when's the marathon? Saturday. <laughs> yeah, what, what I know that? that's me. That's me though. Uh, yeah. If you believe you can achieve anything in life, so limitless, be limitless. But yeah, yeah, obviously the ideally preparation wise, it's not. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, you have to train, you have to put a training schedule in place, you have to have preparation. But yeah, it, it, it came to me kind of last minute um but again it was it was a platform that i used to first run the new york marathon in 2004 um why did you want to do that rich what was the, what was the thing with with running at that stage of, of your life and particularly to, to go to new york what, what got yeah you into that? um for, for me the power of sport empowers you in lots of different ways and um i got to a stage where i was looking for for challenges within sport um 2006 i was going to go to the winter paralympics but um the Paralympics wasn't something that was was necessarily my goal at that point. It was around really pushing myself and the platform that sport gave me the opportunity to talk about my disability, um, what what kind of drives me. And running was something that I'd never really thought of being able to do. I'd seen the Terry Fox story when I was growing up as somebody that never accessed uh, running technology. And he was he was somebody that that really inspired me to think that it was possible. And that's why I say seeing is believing. So the platform that I've given, hopefully people see what I do and understand that anything's possible. Just to explain uh, a bit about the Terry Fox story, what was. Yeah, what was so, that, so Terry Fox um, is a, was a Canadian athlete um, that lost his his leg due to sarcoma. Sarcoma is a cancer. Uh, that um, affected Terry um, and he was in a, a clinical environment that um, f- he felt that was very negative so he had a lot of people that were amputees that were, were basically saying that my life's uh, finished now because they haven't actually got a leg or legs to be able to walk and he said that he wanted to inspire his his public his his amputees his community yeah. and run a marathon a day from east to west of of canada and um raise as much money as he as he could for uh, cancer research now he he on his journey um asked for one canadian uh, dollar every time that he met somebody yeah. and he's raised millions and millions and millions of dollars for um, cancer research yeah. now unfortunately Terry Fox died of secondary cancer uh, secondary sarcoma on his journey so he never actually completed his his, his marathon of hope um, but that, that that set a seed in my head to say when the time comes I want to set on my own kind of personal challenge and initially that was uh, the New York Marathon in 2004 um, and that was that was something that that was my kind of area of self-discovery about what is possible. And on that journey, I've met so many incredible people that have inspired me, told me that things are impossible, but also uh, gave me the opportunities to be successful. Um, Terry Fox, the incredible guy. You watch that, that, that film, look on Netflix, yeah. look on any yeah. provider, you'll be able to see that. And just some of the, the things that he went through resonated um, the environment that I grew up in in the 70s, which didn't have an inclusion spectrum and how the environment for people with disabilities has changed up till now, but we still have a long way to go. Tell us about your friend Simon and what that meant to you. Yeah, so on that on that uh, journey, on that path to, to running the, the 2004 um, New York Marathon, um, I, at, at the stage... I was doing lots of different sports. I was doing our sledge hockey. I was yeah. um, playing recreational sport cricket. And one of one of my really close friends, Simon Mellows, um, lost his leg due to sarcoma yeah. due, due to a, um, a football accident. And at that time I was teaching swimming. So I was actually teaching his, his children to swim as well. And um, I was going through some really tough times, like training for a marathon. Those mm. have, have, have run a marathon or run a 5K or 10K. Sometimes it can be really tough and you have those dark moments. And to see how his family got through um, those really tough times initially really kind of gave me that platform to say, look, sport isn't about that self-gratification. It's not about those gold medals. It's about the impact that it can have on other people. Mm. And um, for me, he, he not just inspired me, uh, for that that New York Marathon in 2004, but also for the rest of my life, I look to all the challenges and obstacles that I've overcome yeah. in my life. He's he's been part of that. Now he unfortunately uh, died in 2005, but mm-hmm. he still 
motivates me to yeah. to to live life to the max and yeah those people that think when you get into your 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s that life just stops it doesn't it's no, about really, what's in yeah. what's in here it's about your heart and just keep driving on to be better every day you need to be better so from new york you you went on to great things in in long and ultra distance running tell us about some of your marathon well, ultra wait, marathon wait a minute so so this is the thing this is the, a lot of people go, oh you've run all these man. so i got conned into doing some of these races so what happened was uh as you, as you alluded to uh yourself and paul jameson came to came to the clinic in nottingham and it was also through one of your other colleagues jamie gillespie that uh yeah. Uh, the prosthetics uh, yeah. uh, and the, the flex ones were, were were given to me initially as something to enable me to run the marathon. But then also it it came to, it, I've run that marathon. It was great. I've got so much uh, publicity from it, raised lots of money for Macmillan Cancer Relief at the time. And Jamie then came to me and said, well, you've ran New York. You, you've actually got a qualifying time to run an ultra marathon. I've got friends in South Africa Mm. Two Oceans Marathon, it's 34 miles, so only a little bit further. But what I do is I'll run it with you. And I'm like, yeah, going, yeah like, I've done 26 miles, 34 miles, that's easy. In South Africa, never been to South Africa before, don't know what the climate's like. That's easy. So halfway in, in, in between that journey of training for that marathon, because I wanted to train for it now, Jamie drops out, yeah. and then now I'm doing it on my own. Well, yeah. well actually, I was... SD and an athlete in South Africa decided to run with me for, for part of the, the event and, and be my chaperone and support network. But yeah, so I'm, I'm like, all of a sudden, I'm this ultra marathon runner. I've only ever run one race before, and that was a marathon. So I've never done a part run because it wasn't it didn't exist. Yeah, I've never yeah. done a 5K, 10K my, or a half marathon. My first, first experience within running was a marathon. My second one was going to be Two Oceans Marathon in Cape Town. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. Like the incredible, and and that 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 moment again. It's, it's it was an important moment in my career because it then it they gave me that experience of what what sports like, what what the situation with amputees and just people with disabilities are in a, on a different continent, and also the reach that you can get through running. Running is such a powerful sport. It's the most inclusive sport because. You can run, you can be pushed, you can be guided, you can walk, you can run, jog, you can run, you can spectate, you can be an administrator, you can be involved. And the, the, these events have showed me that um, just, yeah, whatever age you are, if you, if you want to start a new event running, you just need to have the right preparation. You just so, don't need to run 26 miles without yeah. any training. <laughs> so distance running was your thing. You you made a name. You you made yeah. You, I think you not made a name for yourself. You you dominated that as a as a as a thing. You were, you were very very popular, well respected for it. Getting that in the Paralympic movement, 2012 approaching. What what happened? And then a change of course for you. Yeah, but before even before that, so I ran my first marathon five hours nineteen minutes. So those those children on on the call, that's like going to school for registration and then running all the way through the day until you leave. <laughs> yeah. That's five. That's that's five and a half hours. Yeah, that's, that's so a long day's work. I'm on my feet on my on my well on my prosthetics for five and a half hours nearly running. Yeah. That was like I remember finishing that that, that race going. I'm never running another one. <laughs> so not not running it ever again because it was such a it was such a painful experience but it was a it was an enriching experience crossing that finish line was probably the hardest thing i've ever done and i've done lots of things since but it was one of those things that opened so many doors for me and to put into perspective how far i came from that point to 2009 i ran five hours 19 and then in chicago I ran two hours 42 yeah so the difference, this, the the difference is massive, and that was on the same technology. There's no technology difference here. On yeah. the same technology, all I yeah. had was I had a coach in Liz Yelling, a marathon runner herself, and I had uh, the opportunity to be to, to actually do it properly, to do it properly. And like you said, there wasn't a marathon in in London 2012. Um, I wanted that. I wanted that opportunity, but I think sometimes within sport that path isn't or that ladder isn't straight up or down sometimes it's that path is has got has got its loops and turns and roadblocks and barriers 
But you need to be dynamic. You need to have a team around you that's dynamic enough to understand that maybe the, the challenges in life aren't the actual events, aren't the actual people. You, you challenge yourself, and that's where the fulfillment comes. And um, two hours 42 in Chicago, that was massive for me. That was just like, that's the difference between I came 30, 36,000 or something in New York, yeah. and I came 138th yeah. in Chicago. So you so go diff- from you go from that for a two yeah. hour forty two specialist to yeah. 23, 24 second specialism in, in two. Yeah. Years. And if Charles can be ready on uh, on slide nine to play the video, and let's see what happened twenty twelve that day. Slide nine. But. So away they go. The final of the men's t42 200 meters and whitehead gets the slow start but he will surge through the field and let's see how well he can go now but on the inside scott reardon for australia has the lead and it's jackie or for the united states but here he comes and hits the front it's going to be a goal for great britain and a wonderful run he crosses the line in 24.39 it's a new world record and richard whitehead Quite superb in the latter stages of that race. Came storming through, and the crowd goes wild. Wonderful performance. He celebrates. He has conquered the world. He is the Paralympic champion. Rich, I was there that day, as as were quite (laughs) a few people. And I was I was sat in the crowd, and everyone was going, "He's won! He's won! He's won!" And I was like, "He's he's finished." (laughs) <laughs> because this is, this is one of the blades that you you wore on that. Yeah. And I remember it was either the day or the, the couple of days before your final. I saw this great big crack, crack in the side. I'm like, Rich, I've got to show you this. Do you want to go with it? Do you not want to go with it? And so everything was crossed when we watched that. But but that yeah. was um that was just something else. And we can go back to the slides again, uh, Giles, and I just just go through a slightly different different take on it. Um, I think for for our community. Yeah, it, it was headline news. My mum's neighbours were knocking on her door and saying, now I get what it is you do. You know, it's, it, it, this brought prosthetics um, home and, and what it's like for people who wear prosthetic limbs to the, to the breakfast tables of the country. And you achieved, um, you know, a level of acknowledgement and, and I can't want to say fame. I think it's the right thing, but, but acknowledgement and, and, and respect, I think. And it, it just made people understand what it was that it was was okay to to wear prostheses and it was um you know very very visible and, and almost sort of people were quite quite in in awe of you so here we are in the in the, the shopping <laughs> house <laughs> I that was in the shopping center was Bradford, it? Well, yeah, i think yeah. that me it's and johnny i think yeah. me and johnny came for to meet you guys for coffee and we we're yeah, literally just yeah. we're, that they, we just turned it? around talking to you i think you were in the restaurant and then all of a sudden we turned back and we were like Oh my paper. goodness! All these people have got cameras out, and that was that was before. I think that was actually before we raced. Yeah. But it was it was like that. It was a it was a great thing. And this this um th- this is I I picked this picture up from somewhere. And what what I what I recognise in this picture is that you don't know who she is, but she absolutely knows who you are. And and I think it was it was a big a big change coming out of twenty twelve. Um, if we could just cut the spotlight there and just. Uh, the share sorry coming out of 2012 what what did that um acceptance public persona you know what what did you do what did you do with that how did you use that it's um it's something that obviously athletes but first off it's a great coaster by the way nice this is a great coaster always, uh, always, got, it. <laughs> always got never wear it always got it yeah. um yeah it's it, a lot of athletes they train their life for that moment, yeah. but it's about what you do with that moment. It's really important. And for me, obviously, with a relationship with such as yourselves, being part of the family, uh, being an ambassador, it's about galvanising not just the disability community, but community, yeah. but also your community and the community in Great Britain as a as a patriotic athlete, as a person from this continent, but also um, all over the world and trying to leave a lasting legacy and not just about sport about yeah. enrichment of life and giving you the opportunity to be better and so i remember sitting down with my coach at the time liz yelling and we chatted about 
what 2012 means to me, why I wanted to go and what I wanted to achieve. And it was nothing to do with the gold medal at all. It was about what happened next. And I wanted to kind of replicate somebody like Terry Fox. And yeah. I feel I've never got up to that and then never will get up to that kind of standard. Um, he, he didn't win the gold medals, but he, his, his achievement every day was being a beacon of hope for people with, 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 um, without limbs and for people that have obviously suffered with cancer. Forget, Charles, so I want to take to, us to slide 17, Giles, if you can just pop on. Yeah, so that. I just wanted to do a, a challenge uh, that really pushed me and my team, but also, um, yeah, so Richard runs Britain. So we came up with a concept of running from north to south um, of, of the country, of, 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 of Great Britain. And on the, on the way, raising money for obviously the charities and, and support by supported by the, the charity partner, but also it came evident for me that the awareness for the charity and awareness for, for people that we met was really paramount. And it became a, obviously a, a massive team thing where you look at that picture and you see uh, lots of people that provided their time, effort, uh, drive. And they were the driver behind me. Obviously I was just the one that did the 26 miles a day. And um, but every day, getting on the road and being that the the person that 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 kind of had that 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 destiny of trying to do this crazy thing, and um, it was something that that I was. I, I, I think it's when you achieve that 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 big goal in your life of one running in a Paralympic stadium in front of eighty thousand people, being successful. And then having the responsibility to be able to follow that with a connection with the public, this was it. And it gave, gave me the opportunity to understand what I need to do after, after the Paralympics. And that was to support charities, which obviously in this, this uh, pandemic has been, been massively affected, to give people the drive to... to to continue their own personal journeys, but also to kind of just keep pushing, keep, when when the track stops for me, I won't retire. I will always be doing things. I will always be doing events. I will always be kind of pushing myself and whether that's physically, mentally, or within the disability community. It was quite a journey, Rich, that we were on. Um, it was uh, massive, yeah. To see the cyclists there, a lot of those guys actually <laughs> were on the, the, the La Jog. You know, picked up a few yeah. people on the way. There was a lot of people running with you in the mornings for those yeah. 10, 21 k sections, and then you know, the, sometimes the there were help the because I was obviously I needed that kind of motivation. Sometimes there were hindrance because we were far too slow. Um, but most of all, they were there doing it for the right reasons, and that that was yeah. for that's for supporting other people. And um, again, and it's. It, very happy Leaving memories. that mark on the road every every time we stop. They're still there. there. They're still there. Yeah. Somebody sent still me. Are. Yeah, still still there now. I remember so at the beginning you... it was um big <laughs> big chats with with all the team amongst you and your and your strength conditioning coach at the time, Tim. Um, yeah. Tim was big into the to the measurements. You know, counting your calories and making yeah, sure you yeah. weigh to the beginning of every day and every day. How how did that end, Rich? I don't seem to remember that regime lasting so long. Yeah, not really. You were not really. That's because you kept bringing me donuts. I think oh, what yes. what happened was that. It was it, it became very kind of regimented and strict. Well, obviously, if you're running 26 miles a day, things are changing. Things are and my moods were changing as well. And lots of mood, Rich. Lots of yeah. mood. <laughs> and also it's like patience as well. You, you you've got to you've got to have patience. And so sometimes those patience that you just like changes and um it, it was quite a thing, and there's um, got a nice little bit of film here, which I think sums up towards the end in, in Cornwall. And uh, Cornwall, okay. I think, meant one thing, hills. And, oh, and I think this, this bit of film just sort of shows what we have to Lots of hills. Yeah, absolutely.
I, I want to be like a beacon for other people to say, look, this, 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 this person has actually done these things, whether he's got a disability or not. And I've always had that self-belief that I was going to get to the finish, whether it was whether it was in one piece or, or many pieces, mentally as well as physically. And it is something you did do, Rich. You did get to the finish, but it wasn't without a few wounds. Um, yeah, I, I no, do remember. Definitely. I do remember quite early on that uh, Lots of you, your, your skin <laughs> took a bit of a took yeah, a bit of a beating, in. and um, and it was quite difficult at one stage. You, there was quite a few. There was a, a low spot where there was some some doubt over whether the project could complete. We were making yeah, some yeah. endless adjustments to the sockets and had to have had to have the serious chat. And and for the first time, Rich, <clears throat> I remember seeing you in a wheelchair and yeah. re really understanding that somebody who we see like you as you know, being super athletic, mobile, championing the cause, but then suddenly brought down to earth pretty, pretty brutally, really. And, and, yeah. Yeah. and also yeah, the, what, what happened the, on the road with between being on your, on your legs and upright and then being almost invisible when you decided yeah. to take the, the wheelchair route. How, how I, I think it's what's name. I think it's, I think it's important that they understand that obviously these, these challenges are, are going to have up, ups and downs, but it's about learning from, from that and um, learning about how that sometimes you need to rely on your team and you need to also kind of go back to the reason why we um, we we set that challenge. It was to obviously support other people. It wasn't really about me. I was just obviously the the driver behind the project. It's um, yeah. a, and it's a massive opportunity for me. It, it was um, a self learning. I think we always. Uh, always learning about each other and the, the the possibilities of what is possible and um and that yeah like you say look at that picture there we had a lot of lot of tech a lot of lot of we only broke one one foot didn't we as well we yeah i was coming one. on to that i was coming on to that yeah but, um, yeah yeah <laughs> but but somebody somebody who's a good friend of yours dave baird i mean you you brought him along for the photography and some of what he did was absolutely beautiful i think yeah, and the the photography that he kind of ca encapsulated the um, the whole project through um, through through picture and the ability to be able to um, kind of um, yeah pictureize yeah, he, my story and yeah he, and, he brought this got this beautiful book though and it's a real sort of a uh, just a great sort of pictorial journey i think that that yeah you, you yeah went through and, and there's you know it's nicely oh, related loads, man, yeah. but it just just sort of captures that moment if anyone's not seen this i mean you you can you can get hold of this but it's a really really great great piece of work and and every time you look through it brings back it brings back quite yeah. a few memories we can go back yeah, to definitely. The presentation gels on slide um slide 36 if you would do that for us That'd be great. I know on the on the route we inspired a lot of people. You had um, your fan club for the elderly sort of cage. <laughs> children as well. We met a lot of school kids on the way. A lot that of school was, kids, yeah. Really and remember this uh, this person also we met on the way down. Um, just click that slide on for us, Giles, if you would, thanks. Yeah, I know it's awesome, and the the, the opportunity to to be able to um, support other people and other amputees through what I was doing. So so remember Marina here that we met on. on yeah, the Ma yeah. yeah, Marina and her family were it was a it was literally like um, and this was this was the case a lot of times with 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 um, amputees and um, people that had heard my story. It was kind of a chance uh, meeting and the, the, the kind of questions that, that and the, the, the conversation that we had was more about kind of her and kind of it just showed her that 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 her journey in life that, that it, it was possible right seeing is believing and 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 then to be able to provide provide her with some running blades and to see her jog I know, and yeah I know you were awesome. particularly sort of um inspired by meeting her and uh and actually yeah, she's, no. she's uh she's on the call tonight Rich you know Awesome. So, yeah, I bet she's so, a bit older than now, isn't she? So yeah, absolutely. So Marina, if you're there, I know you're not don't want to go into the camera, but if you wanted to type a question in for Rich tonight, please, please do that. Yeah. Marina's mum sent in some photographs of, <laughs> of how it was at that time. And like, she did she did get her blades and is and is doing you know doing pretty pretty awesome. good those. So yeah. So, and that, that's a, and that's the thing though, isn't it? I think when we look at we look at the end point, we look at the success of, of what 
what people do and and this isn't a Paralympic success it's about it's about having your own personal goals and then whether that's climbing a mountain whether that's running jogging whether that's getting up onto your feet with a with a platform that prosthetics or orthotics give you um it's for me it's about having your own personal goals and then and then really going for them and not and not just going oh you want to be Richard Whitehead I want to be a Paralympic gold medalist no you want to be yourself and be the best a form of yourself because you can be better than Richard Whitehead because he's just an, an average Joe. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so that, that was that was a that was quite a time for you. Know, that, that that was a while ago. Now you, you're talking about future projects and things like that. But what mm. I want to move on to now is some of the the other work that you've been you've been engaging. We've seen you on TV a lot. Mastermind, Question of Sport, other bits and bobs. Um, Giles, if we can go straight to slash. Is that what you're going to three? <laughs> <laughs> see see I, I i know you too well I literally I know, whatever slides you're going to put up, i probably know you're going to put them up anyway i've not seen the pictures i've not seen that picture obviously before but i knew you'd mentioned something about this i was in uh, the caravan in your well I say in your caravan it was in your um your, your accommodation that when when that when they, those those were delivered to you and you weren't happy having to wear those at all <laughs> no i wasn't happy at all <laughs> but but the reason why you were there is because i had prosthetic issues didn't i because the water, yeah. Because the water, yeah. I don't know what's happened. I don't know what's happened, Rich. The the, the legs aren't working. The Smoking a bit, working. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I I I think the again like a, a game show, a TV show, um, gives you that platform to be able to outreach to, to yeah. Well, that was five meters. Obviously, I I did a handstand off, and at ten meters, um, and that was awesome. That's. Live on TV, what do you what do you do? Yeah, do a handstand off off ten meter board. I think it was, um, um, was a gutsy thing to do. But yeah, but yeah, and, and that's somebody on that. Yeah, Tom Tom Daly, and he's featured recently in your track and ball podcast. That's it. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so you you've had some great guests on that. Tell tell us a little bit about about what this is and how people can access yeah. it. Yes, yeah, so that's a collaboration between myself and Ellen White. Um, Ellen was actually playing Champions League tonight uh, for Man City. She actually scored against Florentino, I think. Um, it, track and ball is you can uh, subscribe YouTube, um, and we do live sessions uh, where we engage with school kids. We engage with um, people from lots of different uh, communities. But essentially, it's for the viewer. And we've yeah. had some great guests, so Chris Hoy, Tom Daly, Ronnie O'Sullivan, Rebecca yeah, Adlington, um, talking about those those issues that the athletes have, that you kind of have this big moment and then what happens next? Or engaging with the, um, the audience or the fans. And it's really important that we kind of get to know what the spectators want to see from the athletes so we've got like loads we've got loads of really 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 good um um guests coming on that really push our kind of thought process about things like mental health about anxiety about um uh, performance about uh um body image um and for me, it's, it's, it's kind of pushed uh, who I am, and it's a it's, it's a platform that I've not really I've not really been a podcaster or not really yeah. done that in the past before. But I think it's really important to to be able to engage with the public on different media, and and that gives me the opportunity. So everybody here, please subscribe, yeah. Track and Ball it's YouTube, good. and let us know what you want to see, and we'll do that. Rich, I want to move on now a little bit. Giles, if you can go to slide fifty and talk about some of the the prosthetics, you know, some of the prosthetic issues that you've you've had as um as both an athlete and, and also as somebody who wears wears prosthesis regular but talk a little bit about in your sport that's the, photoshop right <laughs> yeah i know some people say it's not real um so, that's... so this this was sort of at the time when you know oscar pistorius was uh, at the end of his time, at yeah. the end of his time maybe it was a it was a new a new sort of breed of, of athlete power athlete coming in who were sort yeah. of specialist but he was always complaining he never knew which Alan he was running against which I think yeah is a fair point and I know you you've had some issues with rules and rule changes tell us a little bit about about the rules always live within the rules right always live in the rules but make the rules work for you that's the that's the that's the that's the key I um so for I, I came on the scene on the track 2011 um 
at uh, Christchurch in New Zealand. Wow. This kind of maverick athlete kind of, that wanted to change the world, right? And um, for instance, I met with a performance director that year. He said, "You're too old. If you if you want to be successful on this team, you need to get to you need to one qualify for uh, Christchurch, which I did. I was the last seat on the on the plane to go to Christchurch." I then went to Christchurch and basically I had to win to secure funding. And the race before, do you remember the race before? The race before in Auckland. Yeah. I've got the footage somewhere. The race before. Girls. Yeah, have you got that? Have you got that? And I thought, see, again, I know, I know what you're gonna do. The race before, have you got the video? Yeah. Yeah, it's coming. 57. Okay, this happened. Keep your eye on Rich. Uh... So away we go. There's the start. Always a slow start, right? Big crowd, Rich. Big, Big crowd. Big crowd. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Oh yeah. Sorry so, and that's and that's the thing. Um, obviously, technology at the time, I was like obviously really pushing, pushing the limits of technology. I'd not got an experience in, of uh, obviously categories or yeah. or how far to push the technology. I'd gone out to um, to New Zealand to run uh, the marathon as well as the two hundred meters. The last race going into uh, Christchurch that happened. Yeah. Obviously, not ideal preparation, but obviously, again, working with people that are dynamic, you can rely on. I make that call home. I need some. I need some new feet. When do you need them by? Yeah. In three days, when I get to Christchurch, and um, came up with the goods, right? Made it happen. I want to. Um, it, I, I want yeah. to introduce my my colleague Aaron now. So um, uh, into this. So it's it's a good a good time to bring Aaron into the into the meeting. Aaron, if you pop your camera on, uh, and and your microphone. Aaron is one of our um, composite carbon fiber engineers in Iceland. Aaron, maybe you could introduce yourself and what what's your role within our organisation? Yeah. Hey. Um, thanks for including me in this. It's it's not very often that they kind of <laughs> you, 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 the you don't get out much. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. They kind of keep us in some some rooms. Uh, yeah. So my job actually. So I work with Richard and, and other athletes. I'm actually responsible for the for the running blades or the sport feet uh, at Usher. Um, and I work within R and D in Iceland. Um, yeah. So if I go to um slide uh, fifty one, Giles, if you can just just let that that one run and just uh, we'll just have a look at sort of Richard's normal. Um, running gear. This is a, a nice clip we've got of you, Rich. It's just you make this look so so easy. People would say. I mean, is is running easy for you? Oh, it looks it, isn't it? Um, it's not. It's not. I know I, it's not. I think. Uh, yeah, I think the technology is obviously there for me and to give me a platform to be able to run. But it's not. It's not a case of any double leg amputee, single leg amputee can put on this technology and then run or run the times that I do or run the distances. It's about it's about the training. It's about utilising mm -hmm. specialists such, and such the, the guys that that's you, on the call. The blades that you use, um, you know, you're using those for your, for your jogging, for your warm-ups, but they kind of impact that goes through the procedures yeah. when, you're, massive, when you're running yeah. at these speeds. These are huge speeds. And you're running against your, your able-bodied colleagues at a high, at a high part there. Aaron, what kind of forces do you sort of go through a prosthetic blade during these kind of trainings? Yeah, I mean it's 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 massive forces. I could say that. Uh, actually, I have to say, it's like an engineer's worst nightmare to to see like a broken running blade like that. Yeah. What you showed before, it, you kind of it makes your yeah. stomach like to sink because um, you you know like how how fast he's going when he's running, yeah. and if this happens in a just a fraction of yeah, a I've second, had a couple yeah, oh. I've had a couple of rubbish instances where they're broken. <laughs> I think I think there's still that imprint on the wall, yeah. um, and I'm reaching speeds of like 23 and a half, 24 miles an hour. So obviously, um, if 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 technology fails, then you kind of that that hurts. It's like being hit by a car at 23, 24 miles an hour. But as Richard Hirons has always told me, 
you the technology is there to be pushed right and uh it's for um, people like me to push the the people that make the technology i'm, I'm yeah, happy yeah, to yeah, see yeah, a, exactly. a broken blade you did say that remember right <laughs> yeah I, I i believe in it i think you, you find your limits don't you but we can just come out of that giles and and aaron if we can talk to you a little bit about what I mean, Rich has been over to Iceland a few times to work with with your with your team, your boys and girls. And what 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 kind of testing process do you go through? What what are the rules that us as an organisation have to have when we're providing official sporting equipment? Yeah. So, kind of, if we start with like when we when we get the guys over to to work with us, we we normally form a a team of people, and it's often a short time frame it could be three to three to five days and rich has been over more than a few times um, and then in that group we would have mechanical engineers biomechanists uh, and we would do every, everything to try to kind of help them to maximize the outcome of the equipment um, but in the end i mean it's 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 always it's equipment it's it's always about it's i mean it's equipment but it's i mean they are professional athletes yeah and um, so i mean I think that's something that we're we're always very keen to impress upon. When when the when the you know it's the big TV time of the big games, and you know we get friends, neighbours, family members saying, "Oh, will you be there doing some adjustment?" No, that ended a long time ago. What what's the time frame, Aaron? Between say let's say Tokyo twenty twenty as was, when did the project for the for the running blades you've been working on? When did that complete? Yeah, so I mean, Usher has been developing and, and making running blades for years, and there's always like an ongoing development or interaction with the athletes. And like Richard said, like they are, they are kind of, what do you say, stimulating or you're kind of yeah. pushing us, you're pushing the boundaries of our equipment, and we kind of take that challenge and we try to improve. And it's a really like a healthy uh, way to work. Um, but like, for, for instance, for Tokyo, I mean, we're releasing three new blades or we have already released three new blades for Tokyo and it was a two or a three year project where we had people coming over helping us to do to develop the equipment and I mean like I said like the equipment we can't just make something and just give it to the guys and say yeah I mean you should run on this it, it's not they, they need years to kind of train their body and tune into the equipment and like you put their mind to it and etc. So for Tokyo, we kind of finished the blades in 2019 um, because it was, of course, 2020. And then they were released and they were, they have to be commercially available. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of, it's, it's, it's fair. It's, it's, a, it's an official rule that the blades need to be commercially available so everyone can, can use them. So it's a kind of a level playing field. I guess. And you've got some example of some blades there that you can, you can just show us. And, and Rich, for example, yeah. When, when you get a new piece of equipment, it's not a question of you, you try that and you run faster. You and your coach have to integrate that into your training program and, and look to see if you can exploit or find any change in, in your performance, not, not yeah, just I, speed. I think, I think, I think it's, it's more, it's the athletes, the person that wins the medals and the platforms given by, obviously, the, the prosthetics. Um, and I think we've, we've always had the opinion that... It's about building the athlete and maximizing the athlete's potential through the prosthetic. So not looking for a performance uh, gains through the, the prosthetics, but looking for the platform that enables you to be a better athlete. Um, and that's really important. And, and we as a, as a team, so myself and my coach, as well as obviously uh, you guys at OSA, We've always had that relationship, so it's like a jigsaw. How does how does the prosthetics fit into the picture, and how do we frame Richard Whitehead's performance with the with the prosthetics inside that? And it's about again, it's a drip free feed process. It doesn't Richard Whitehead doesn't go to ice and come back with this prosthetics all of a sudden run like a train. It's it, it I I get the obviously the prosthetic um, equipment, and then we integrate that into a training schedule that might be three months might be six months might be 18 months yeah um aaron what would you have there uh yeah i mean it's everything richard said it's completely true it's like I often think it's like painting a picture richard it's yeah. you're you're trying to link together the things so actually i'm just going to show like this is the plate that richard is running on um and then we kind of made the long jump plate i don't know if you can see 
really big charge. I mean, it's yeah, made for long jump, so yeah. extremely high forces. So it's about uh, 500 kilos. So yeah, five kilos. It's about my kilos. weight, though. Is. <laughs> yeah, so it needs to take that in the in the yeah, heavy yeah. Charge. So I mean, it needs yeah. to. Yeah. <laughs> and then here's another one. This would be a running blade. Um, I always get challenged in the in the media around the time of the games about people having to yeah you know, it's feel I have to justify the let's use the, the phrase that always comes up the the so-called unfair advantage yeah you know, there's there's nothing fair in life is there but they they're just pieces of equipment that enable athletes to be to be the best that that they can be and, and I yeah listen like people with disability have an advantage that they have the disability and they're utilizing that it's not don't use your dis don't don't think that your disability is a, is a dis disadvantage in life everybody has obstacles to overcome now now we're naturally overcoming them so we're learning and we're we're now passing on our knowledge our experience our toolkit to the to the able-bodied community and the able-bodied community are now able to problem solve due to our experiences so those that are out there that have a disability see that as a, an advantage and a, and a platform to be able to enrich other people's lives through your experiences. And obviously I've, I've been ex accessing this, this technology now for, for a while. And it's about obviously accessing that, but also enriching people like Aaron and his team, what is actually possible and yeah. where technology can go as well, not just in the feet, but in, in, all areas of life. I think that's the thing as well. And Aaron, as a sort of a closing point from you, you you're responsible for, for this area of, of product um, investigation, R&D in our organisation. But how does that filter down to, to the regular stuff? Yeah, I mean, like exactly like Richard said, can I, you guys are pushing us and, and in some cases we're pushing, pushing back and we managed to develop something and then that would kind of feed down. It's, I mean, it's for everyone. I mean, for instance, if we take an example, uh, Azure made the, the first running blade that Azure made, um, it was for adults, but then there was a junior version that was made from that for, for kids. So yeah, it's there, yeah, exactly. And so you look, at, look at how, how it's impacted on life now as well with obviously you've got, you've got the, not just the, the, the blades, the, the running blades, but it's also the orth orth orthotics, but how commercially now carbon fiber has gone into uh, running uh, trainers yeah, and yeah. obviously the partnership yeah. that I have with Nike and, and being involved with such mm -hmm. a great brand as that, it, that, then there's massive crossover, but this is where, this is where disability and mainstream has, has kind of collided. Now we all realize that people with disabilities are problem solvers and that's what we have in life. We have lots of problems and you need people to solve them. Mm -hmm. um, Aaron, I'm going to say thank you for that and let you let you go. But thanks, yes, thanks for your contribution. Oh, um, and Rich, I'm going to touch on sort of one last thing, Giles, if we can just get ready to go to slide 61. But we talked there, Rich, about you being um, an athlete, and, and I know that through since the time I've known you, you 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 held down a full time job and made a big sort of life decision to go part time so you could yeah. get more involved in what some people might think. Yeah, it's a hobby, you know, sort of week weekend warrior really, but a professional athlete and it, it i think even on our side it took some understanding of, of the commitment you you gave to that and becoming a full-time athlete and training is a, is a big part of your regime i've got a, a, a good good clip from your website here to play Lots of animal noises there. Yeah. Um, that's, the, that's the way it is. And, uh, we can just stop that there, John. That's great. I mean, I, I've, I've been to some of your training sessions, not not to train, obviously, just for lunch, but, but it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's full on. And, um, and maybe, Giles, if you can go straight to slide 63. I, I remember, <laughs> a bit, little bit weird this is, but I, I saw something quite incredible. I was um, at that other place with you. Uh, th this, which was a <laughs> looking bright red print. 
Oh, you have my back slaps. Yeah. Back slaps. Oh. This was the end of you. Was he you doing uh, starting drills? And, and this this was the big one. And I've never. Yeah, heard... yes, I got a bit of a back slap because I needed a bit of a yeah, a bit of an adrenaline rush. Yeah, but yeah, um, yeah the, um, and and you have to go through those kind of those those things. I I will always say that if if people can beat me in the gym, then they can. The, the better than me than deserve to beat me on the track. And I'm lucky enough that I've had, again, lots of people around me that have been able to support my training and, yep. and kind of push me. I, like the people that train me are not people that train disabled athletes. They train no. athletes. They tra um, I, I, I'm coached by people that have I put Olympians on the podium. Oh. I've, I've, I'm coached by people that that are in professional sport and whether that's football, whether that's rugby. I've, I've seen that, that down at High Pack. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mixed environment. And, and you're, 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 yeah, you're definitely. And you need that. You need to area. have, and, and, and those practitioners that are out there that, that want to be challenged, definitely look at the, the disability community because that's going to challenge your way of thinking, not the actual athlete. It's going to challenge your way of thinking to be able to adapt your philosophy to be a, able to be an inclusive uh, practitioner. And that's what all my team have, have said to me actively that they've done uh, professional able-bodied athletes and then moved to disability athletes and they've learned more because they've had to yeah. think about on the feet. And that's yeah. who I want. I want people that are dynamic and able to enhance me and my team. Rich, we're coming to the end of our time. It's been a, a, a quick a quick hour, but a, but a bit of uh, insight there. We, we do have some questions for you. I hope I'm going to get those yes. from them but i'm going to start with one that i, and I know it's from my colleague katie because she's a, a girl who lifts but just very quickly athlete to athlete what's your morning routine <laughs> what's my morning routine <laughs> my morning routine is try to stay in bed as long as possible take That's the kids to, take the kids to uh <laughs> take the kids to school and then go to the track or go to the gym and train um i think you've got to you've got to have a work-life balance and i've got two two young children and they cut, they see daddy runs. And so I, I do run, but also I'm, I'm a dad and you kind of, that's, that's a big part of who I am. And, and when I go on the track or when I go to the, the gym or when I, when I compete, that I, that's part of me. And I, I feel that's enhanced who I am. It's, it's not an added pressure. Um, it's scheduled and timetabled. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's important to be um, like, even now with all, all kind of webinars and the kind of technology, it, it adds value to who you are and yeah. it gives you a better reach. Stuart, over to you. Uh, you've got some more questions, I think. Hi, guys. Yeah, really fascinating stuff. First of all, Marina is in the audience and she just wanted to say thank I'll you so much question, for yeah. starting her journey uh, with the blades. Only the one pair snapped so far, so not too bad. <laughs> uh, she said you've inspired lots of running in sports, including two superhero triathlons, swimming, running and rugby. Great to Brilliant. see you tonight. Thanks again. Uh, oh, yeah. but, uh, I think Marina had a, another question just on the back of that. Have you got any tips of how to look after your skin when wearing prosthetics for so long and under such intense pressure while running and training? And it's and, and I think as a as a youngster, and I've I've had lots of lots of times when I've just ran through things. So when I get abrasions or or, or different issues on my on my stumps or sweating, or, it, it's about kind of you need to self preservation. You need to preserve obviously your skin because. That that's that needs time to repair, like I found on my forty marathons in forty days. Um, so you need to yeah take off your your socket, towel down, and 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 look at the affected area. It's if you continue to push on, the blister becomes small, then becomes larger, and then you can't get your everyday uh, prosthetics on. So it's really about care, and it's it's about looking at. Um, obviously everybody's every every amplitude is different so sweating and, and sockets are all different but it's about working with your prosthetist working with uh, people around you to have the best skin condition so I now as a 40 40 40 plus year old I'm still really conscious on on my my stump care yeah. and uh, that's really important yeah it's a good question thank you Marina thanks for joining that's a great me question evening. yeah Another question from Ross Bradley. Uh, he says, hi, Rich. I've been an amputee for six years now. He's a final year student at uh, prosthetics and orthotics at Salford University and plays rugby as well. His question nice. is twofold. How has lockdown affected your fitness or has it affected your fitness on a physical and mental level? Yeah. And do you have any advice on how to get back into athletics? 
But yeah, so mentally, it's, it's been tough. Um, just, I'd, I'd, I'd literally given everything for 2020 to happen. Yeah. So, like, body fat was down to, like, 8%, lifting heavy, uh, fast on the track. And then to have it all kind of the rug pulled from me, it was really tough. Um, because Tokyo uh, in 2020 was going to be my last games. And to kind of really go, look, I'm going to not just go to Tokyo, but I'm going to win. I'm going to put everything, on, have a winning team. And so to have that pulled away, really tough. Physically, I kind of just ate a lot, drank a bit, and just kind of relaxed. Like I think everybody else did in the first lockdown. But then to re re-engage with the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. And that is, it's not just about me winning, it's about me leaving that legacy and also helping other pe- people like yourself to be able to have that pathway. So your second part of your question, I think it's really important. So at the moment, obviously with lockdown, development sport has been massively hit. Mm. So it's about taking on that role yourself, maybe talking to practitioners about how they can integrate some kind of program or connect with you through social media or, or through zoom and then support that process. Maybe individual programs of, of stability and fitness, but then also kind of get back to running. But also remember when you start exercise, it's not a bullet a gate. It's not Richard White had run into 26 miles. It's about starting really uh, low intensity, low mileage or low distance, and then just building up. I do exactly the same every time I start again. And build your confidence. It's about building confidence to have a better experience through whatever sport you do. But though it's the same, it'll be the same for all of your competitors and, and your um, yeah, your adversaries. But, but do you think you've also been in a good place to bounce back from that? You know, you've got a good level of resilience. Yeah, I think obviously through the experiences that I've had in sport and I've got a track record of kind of investing in myself. So recovery strategies that I've got and whether that's warm or, or, or ice or stretching yeah. or yeah. investing in yourself is really important and yeah. uh, it just doesn't happen like those races that you see look on youtube you can see all my races those races don't just happen you need to have a strategy in place that that kind of builds up and whether that's four year strategy or six month strategy it's all about a build and start off i i, I miss recreational sport because it's all about enjoyment sometimes the the pressure and the expectation of winning is really tough so those that are doing recreational sport at the moment enjoy it uh get out into the community educate the community and show everybody what you can do uh stuart any more questions for you you? uh we'll have one last one uh there's been a few in there but the last one from hazel cooper uh did it take you a long time to find a prosthetic that fitted comfortably Ooh, that's a great uh, so uh <laughs> sockets sockets uh are the thing that's important so it's all about fit feel faster feet that's uh that's my kind of uh saying helped by um another richard rich nevens from um right. proactive in uh, in guildford and it's about working with people I'm working with resources and understanding it does take time. And it's, you, you've got people around you that are very experienced. They've got massive toolkits. Now, the toolkit that you might use might not be the toolkit initially you want. And that experience, that knowledge, but also them getting to know you and you getting to know them, will, will, will you'll see the fruits of that. And... I have, I've had leather sockets, which I did the 40 marathons in 40 days, into a better socket system now, a suction socket system. But it's all about what works for you. Don't look at whatever somebody else uses and go, yeah. I want what Rich White, Johnny Peacock, whoever is using. Just give it time, enjoy think, the experience, and then you'll come out on top. I think I have another sort of component to that answer as well, which is being on the on the other side of the equation. Um, myself and some of my, my colleagues, and you're going through a referral to get to get rich and being proactive to to really help. And and I think the word might be convince you or to really encourage you to change because I think you've done so well on those those leather sockets that you'd had for some time, there was a reluctance and then maybe not a need to let, to, to move on from those. They've done you well. Yeah. And, and also you, you, you get confidence in that, yeah. that, that system. Also, sometimes it's like with my training, I, I would run and I'll be going, 
that's awesome. And then my coach would go, actually, you've got this, this and this to, to improve. Yeah. Or yeah. he'll show me the video and say, actually, you've got that. That's rubbish. We need to improve all of this. It's the yeah. same kind of thing with walking prosthetics. Yeah. You kind of you've got a system or running process. You've got a, you've got uh, your setup and then you kind of think it's right. And then you look back at some video and you go, actually, you're not moving symmetrically or, or there's better options out there. And it's been open, like I say, I've, I'm a quite dynamic as a person. It's been open and dynamic, but also having a team around you that yeah. also is open and dynamic and, yeah. and will invest their time and energy in, in mm. obviously the best and Having that, that relationship. That, that, I think Relationships that, are key. key. Communication yeah. and relationship, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So for anybody who's a prosthesis user uh, and any prosthetist who's you're working with patients, it, it's having that, that trustful relationship. And that's yeah, that, that's a thing for sure. Stuart, one last question, I think. Yep. There was a question from Stacey Kay, and you might have actually just answered that. But she said, apart from adaptability, what would you say are the most important things that you get from your prosthetic team and have these differed as you have progressed through your experiences? Mm, yeah, I, th I think it's also... Uh, the, I, I, I work a lot on having that relationship and being able to communicate how I'm feeling as an amputee and what I'm looking for. And it's again, back to this painting a picture and framing kind of what my expectations are. And it's not, I'm, I don't go to the prosthetist and go, I want to run fast, make it happen because that's my training. It's about, this is what, what the platform that I want. Let's investigate how close I can get to that. And, mm -hmm what I'm feeling through that process. So that will be through the fitting process all the way to running, all the way to kind of the adjustment and be, be flexible and don't want it today. Live for, live for tomorrow. And um, that's, that, that's what's really important. And, and also it's like having that relationship where you can have those honest and transparent conversations where if things aren't right, say, look, it's just not right let's let's kind of either start again or let's look at a different angle and having lots of different eyes sometimes isn't the way but having different approaches maybe is as well and i could add a sort of a prosthetic answer to that as well a little bit a kind of a prosthetic answer between the world champs after 2012 and prior to 2016 rio i had an approach from the bbc wanting to say what, what's new in prosthetics what what's happened what what's improved and i said oh, actually nothing uh, the blades are the same, but something must have changed. No, 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 the, the blades are exactly the same. The athletes have got better. The, the training regime, the way that British athletes are funded, um, I think that's very much part of it. And you can't always just be looking at the technology. The, the, the athletes have been training hard, improving hard, and that's where the improvement came. And there was no interview because they weren't interested because there was no... There was no technology. It's because you were born, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> you can't you can't take it away from from what what you guys you guys and girls do on the track. You put it down there, and the team that support you are a part part of that. So I think I think that's that's a very a very positive part of that. Rich, we're going to end it there. I'm going to say thank you very much for that. Uh, a, a, a interesting journey through a little bit of background and stuff. Um, and I'm going to hand back to Stuart Rich. Thanks again. Thanks for joining us. This evening. Any other and questions? Thanks. Feel free to fire them over yeah, Instagram, over Twitter, yeah. whatever. I'll answer them. Brilliant. Good. Over to you, Stuart. Back to you. Just a very quick uh, thank you to our own Richard Hirons. Very good. Uh, and also to Rich. What an inspirational story. Fascinating. And a really quick hour that that flew by. So, so just to say thanks to to everybody for watching. Uh, there are a couple of more webinars coming up uh, on the 24th of March. Uh, my colleagues in prosthetics will be doing early amputee rehabilitation to walk or not to walk. So look out for the, uh, the invite coming in your email inboxes for that. And on the 31st of March, we'll be looking at contemporary treatments for the injured knee uh, with Paul Tricker, who's a consultant orthopedic surgeon at Ashford and St. Pete, and also uh, Andrew Gould, who's a physiotherapist at Pure Sports Medicine in London. So with that, thank you all for watching and we'll see you again soon.